Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk here. It's actually my first time talking at a programming conference, so it's pretty great. Um, and I, actually, because it's my first time, I thought I'd give you a quick introduction of how I, ended, I, I actually ended up here. And it's kind of a long story, but I'm going to condense it because I only have so much time. So I'm actually a medical doctor. Um, this is me wearing blue clothes with longer hair. And I kind of like got into coding while studying, and I didn't really know like what to do with my life, which is maybe also resembled in my choice of programming languages here. Um, <laughs> but like after one year of pretty much not figuring out what to do, I ended up at Morantix, which is a Berlin-based deep learning startup. And we're developing a medical software, which has like some deep learning features in them. So I was the first non-machine learning engineer actually to join there, and also the first doctor to join, by the way. And so the first thing I did was actually implement Clojure as language of choice for everything except machine learning. So I implemented Clojure, and that was like fairly easy because I was the only person on my team, basically. So <laughs> I did that. Um, and now we actually have like a great team of uh, three full-time developers doing Clojure and Clojure Script, except me. Now I'm doing other stuff. So some, some quick disclaimers. Uh, firstly, I'm a medical doctor, but I'm not your medical doctor, so everything I present here is not medical advice. It's just, uh, it's just my personal experience, which I'm sharing with you today. Secondly, I work in a machine deep learning startup, but I myself don't work and don't code machine learning code. So this has actually been a side project of mine. Um, and don't expect it to be super solid machine learning, and don't even expect it to be correct. Um, I promise that we actually do serious machine learning at Merantix, but uh, this is not it. <laughs> so what basically came up is, I call this brain fog. So basically what I had is, when I was coding, and like in this year after graduating as a doctor, I was coding a lot, and I kind of noticed that my concentration would really vary from day to day. Um, and this seemed to be super inexplicable to me, and I didn't really like, and it really annoyed me because as a coder, you get really sensitive about like how productive you are at a certain day because you notice at the latest the next day when you review your code from the last day and know like how crappy it was, and then so it, it really annoyed me. It's, it's much less so as a business person, maybe, like writing emails and talking to people on the phone. Maybe you like don't really like need all your brain power for that. So. Um, so this, this concept came up, but then I found an interesting correlation because this was after my studies. So I was like kind of lazy and kind of coding a lot. So I was eating a lot of kebabs, um, and then I suddenly noticed, okay, every time I eat a kebab, uh, I kind of like feel super un unfocused the next day. So the kebab theory was born. Um, <laughs> and then as a good doctor and researcher, obviously I had to do a small study on this. So. I basically ate all the kebabs which I could find in my town just to like, control for this kebab factor and actually see if it was like some global ingredient in all kebabs triggering this. Um, turns out it actually worked, so I always was unfocused the next day. So I kind of thought, okay, it's explained, fixed, right? It's the kebab, so I just never eat kebabs again and then we're fine. Um, and it kind of worked, it got better, I don't know why. Um, and so it kind of resurfaced when I actually moved to Berlin to work full-time at Morantix. Um, and I still wasn't eating kebabs, what actually like, is quite an achievement in Berlin. Um, and then, so it kind of annoyed me because I couldn't pinpoint it again. I, I had really optimized everything, including my sleep. So I was kind of looking for some, for some like, I wanted to like, apply data science to this problem and solve it, right? And then it occurred to me, <laughs> I already had done a very similar project. So it reminded me of NoFap. <laughs> NoFap was when I learned JavaScript in 2014. So NoFap was basically the idea. Well, a friend of mine visited me, and we were like, oh, let's learn JavaScript. Let's code an app. And then there was this Ionic framework with Angular 1 in these dark ages. And then we, would, we wanted to code an app. And I said, cool, I have this theory. It wasn't the kebab theory. It was the theory before that. And this theory was that as a guy, masturbation is linked to a decrease in mood in the next few days. So this was like, this is not medical advice, this was my personal theory. So, so I thought, great, like we can solve this problem, we'll just write an app, and then like we'll globally collect this data, and then we run data science on it, and then like we have, we have, we have basically done our study and we've, we've proven it, right? So um, this is actually from, this is so not from the Google Play Store. I promise, I promise it was on the Play Store, but they somehow pulled it in the last few years without me noticing. Um, it was then, it had like actually a few thousand installs, 
And so the only screenshot I got was from this very legit APK site. Um, and the way it worked was basically this. So you could like hit a big button like, oh, I relapsed, I relapsed. Like, so I, I wanked, basically. <laughs> and, then, and then you would hit this button. And then at, at, at any time, you could like, track your mood, energy, and libido on a scale of 1 to 5, respectively. So, and then you could basically plot your mood, for example, since the last time you wanked. So that's, that's the screenshot on the left, right? So you see, like, how, how did my mood like, progress since the last fab? Um, and th now the, the key thing in this is the, the fab experiment, which was a word combination of experiment and fab. And um, so you basically can opt in into the fab experiment, and then you anonymously submit your data to our very secure Firebase servers, and then um, you can, <laughs> and then, <laughs> which were publicly readable and writable, <laughs> and then uh, you, because we had no clue, right? And then. Um, and then we run data science on this, and then we prove it, right? And then, and then we can see, like, oh, masturbation is linked to a decrease or increase in mood, whatever. So the thing is, we never found out, because I kind of downloaded the data, and I was super overwhelmed with it, because like, it's, it's time series analysis, right? You have, like, a, you have a date time thing, and then you have a dictionary of different variables. And it's super, time series analysis is super complex. And I didn't cover that in medical school. In medical school, you cover like two weeks of statistics, and obviously, time series analysis is not part of it. So keep that in mind when you go to the hospital, that doctors only cover two weeks of statistics. <laughs> um, so this all, this all changed when I came across this repository, which was on Hacker News some time ago, some years ago, I think. And this was a guy who did something kind of similar, but for weight loss. So he wanted to basically optimize his activities, including his food, to lose weight. And it's pretty cool, because that also seems like a time series problem, right? right? Because like, you, have, you do different things at different times, then you measure your weight, and then you want to know, OK, what influenced my weight? But the way he did it was like, super simple, and I thought it was pretty genius, at least for me as a non-data scientist. So he made it a regression problem. So for every day, he would write down his weight and then keywords of what he did the preceding day. And then he would like, just pipe that into Valper Webit, which is kind of a machine learning package, which nobody ever heard of, ex including me, and, um, and basically just like, see how it would weight the factors. So the way it looks is, is this. You have a CSV file in this example. First thing is the date. Second thing is the weight. And the third entries are like a list of keywords. Super simple, right? And then you basically, uh, the list of keywords are the factors of the day before. And then you basically just like transform that a bit into this Valpel web text format thing, which looks extremely similar. And we, we're just calculating the, the differences of the weights, right? So that's, that's fairly straightforward. Um, because you want to know, like, cool, what did, I, what did I do yesterday? And did that lead to me losing like 2.4 uh, pounds, for example? And then I thought, great, I just used this methodology. But instead of weight loss, I use it for my mental focus and a few other things. Um, <laughs> And so that's what I did. Um, the thing was, OK, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The thing was, you can basically run this into an SVM-like algorithm in Valper Webit. And then, and then you can see how the algorithm gives weight to different factors. And then you see, like, OK, cool, the thing most associated with weight loss was sleep, for example. Um, and the thing most associated with uh, weight gain was no sleep. And that's super interesting, even to me as a doctor, because there's scientific evidence for this. Because like, sleep deprivation actually moves your metabolism into a like, worse state, where you actually can become some, something like pre-diabetic. Not really that, but it's, it definitely gets worse. So, and there have been inter interesting experiments there. Um, and it's really cool that like, one person could like, gather the data to kind of prove this by himself. So the correlation project was born. This was basically me applying something very similar, but to my mental focus. And I kind of thought, OK, great, I can, I can over-engineer this, because as a software engineer, I tend to over-engineer everything. So I thought, OK, cool, I can like, write a closure backend, a closure script front end, I can like, use reframe, I can get into GraphQL, and then I can do like, WebSocket stuff, and everything's like, super crazy, and people can use it at home from their phones without internet connection or so, I don't know. But turns out I still had this full-time job at Marantix. So there was no time for that. So what I had to do was I had to use Google Sheets. Google Sheets, <laughs> Google Sheets is actually a really great tool if you have no clue of what your actual data structure is, because I, I truly had no clue. And, and it turned out I actually re, re, like, re, reformatted my Google Sheet because it kind of like changed a few times. So the way it looks is basically this. 
It's, it's very simple. You hit this key combination, and then it enters a date time thing. And then you enter like a category, food, cool, I had food, I had eggs, and then I had toast, and then I had some butter with that. And then you copy paste a bit because it's at the same time. And then I also drank some orange juice, which is category drink. And then later I did like a measurement of my brain fog, which is always a scale from zero to five. Five is super unfocused, zero is super focused. And then, yeah, the last column is this measurement. So oh, I'm very unfocused right now, five. Um, so that, how do we read this data in Clojure? Yeah, obviously, I wanted to do, to do the analysis in Clojure because now I want to do everything in Clojure. Um, and how, how do we do this? So OK, where's the CSV file? This is the CSV file. You export the Google Sheets thing as CSV file, right? Um, and then I, I, wrote like, I wrote like a ton of plumbing. 20 minutes is not very much. So I open source this. And it's, it's really a ton of code. You can have a look at it when you're at home. So I basically read this CSV file. And it's really simple. It's just a vector of strings, right? So every line is one vector. And this is the date time thing. This is the category. This is what I actually entered. And sometimes you have this value, which is an integer, but here it's still a string, right? So then we parse this. Let's parse this. And then we basically just parse this into like one entry is a map. So this is one entry. This is one entry, right? You have the date time parse, cool. You have the category is now keyword. Not much magic, and then the event, which is a string, and the value is nil. Sometimes you have like values like, oh yeah, here my libido, which I also measured is five. So it was kind of an exciting day, I guess, uh, the 17th of May. Okay, so the thing was, oh, the thing was, it wasn't working. So I was getting like an okay accuracy, but really not that good. And the the thing, like as a machine learning person or data scientist. What you do when it, your model doesn't work, obviously, you don't like, question your model and if you're doing like, correct stuff. Instead, you just like, shove more data in and hope that it works now. right? So that's what I did. So I basically, luckily, there's this company tracking me, which is called Google. And, um, so I, and I had Google Fit active already for like two years. So basically, I just exported my Google Fit data, which is CSV files again, luckily. And then I wrote another parser for that, because obviously, now I'm writing CSV parsers all the time. So, and then I put this into like, the same data structure I have, like the date time thing, category Google Fit is obvious. And I, only, I was only was interested in the step count, like the step count, and you get it like every 15 minutes. Right? So, and because like, I had this, this observation that like, when I walk around, it kind of like, helps me focus sometimes, especially on those Sundays where I don't walk around, and I just hang around my own flat, and you like, feel like super shitty all the time. So basically, and the cool thing is, like, because it's like the same sort of data, you just concatenate it, super simple. And then you have like, events with Google Fit, nice. And then we just throw that into our machine learning thing. So I wrote, like, uh, I wrote like this wrapper around Volpa and Rabbit. But first, we have to reduce it. Because we want to, so this guy with the weight loss project, he always had time windows of 24 hours, right? He, he wrote like, what happened the day before and, and correlated it with the weight of the next day. So, but we want to be like, more, like, I don't know, cool. So we want to have like, a, a variable time window. So we want, to have, we want to specify that in hours. So we basically say, cool, I call this filter reduced preceding events. So you basically have, you say, what am I interested in? We want to measure brain, brain fog, right? And like, how many hours of the preceding events do we want to include? Let's say six. Let's see how this looks. So it actually, like, it actually runs a bit because it's kind of inefficient. So it, it, re it, it returns tuples. So, and every tuple, the first entry is the actual measurement. So that, that will always be a brain fog entry here. Brain fog zero, I was kind of focused here. But then the second entry is a map of things I did in the six hours before that, and sorted by, cat uh, keyed by category. So I have like, okay, in the time before that, in the six hours before that, I had food, I had scrambled eggs once, I had butter once, I had Brazil nuts once. And also in Google Fit, I walked like 394 steps. Cool. So let's see, let's, let's check out something else. Um, so here, like brain fog was zero, I was focused again, it seems. I slept late, I took some magnesium, I don't know why. I took food, and also like, I walked a lot, so like 3,000 steps. And then the cool thing is, the Valpa Wabbit format, if we remember, is actually just another view of this data, right? So you just have to do some transformation, and then you end up with like, a very big string. So this is just another view in the Valpa Wabbit format. So this is the brain fog value we're interested in, zero. And then this is, you have like the namespace thing in Volpa Wabbit, which is like the category, so food, scrambled eggs, butter, yada, yada. And Google, fix, uh, Google, Google Fit, you have the steps, right? And then, and then I wrote, I wrote like a ton of stuff, but I'm, I'm keeping it really short here. I wrote like a train and eval loop for Volpa Wabbit, which also splits up the data in a train and test set, which makes sense, right? And then you evaluate it on the accuracy. 
And the cool thing is it's super interactive because Valpo Webit is simply so fast. You don't have to wait for training. So you can run it a few times because it samples the training and test data every time new randomly because like, I couldn't get the random seed to be fixed. <laughs> so, um, so you have it here. And, and it kind of, let's, let's look at this result. It, oh, this is really bad. Let's look at this result. So it, it, kind of like, it kind of works, but it's not much better than guessing. We have an accuracy of 0.26 on the training set. So it's, it's like one out of four is like correct. So that's, that's not really that right. So we have to take a step back. Taking a step back, that's something what I should have done in the first place and like questioning whether my approach was right. And there are two major problems in my approach. Firstly, like my measurement of concentration or brain fog is super subjective. Like who came up with this? Like I, I mean like, but who came up with a scale from zero to five? Super subjective, right? Um, and like, is it like now a two or is it more like a three? Like who, who knows? So, and then it actually turns out uh, some of my friends studied psychology. So I asked them, and then there's this thing you can do called a Stroop test, which is like a concentration test. Um, so how does a Stroop test look? There's, luckily, there's this Android app, which is not entirely broken, and it's on the Play Store. And <laughs> you, you, can, you can use it. And it, you basically always have to, you have to tap the color of the thing you see. So these are hashes, and they're blue. Obviously, you tap blue. But the buttons in the bottom, they always change positions. So you tap it blue, and it, it takes your time while you do this, right? And then it gives you, you do multiple rounds of this, and it measures your time. So this, this is straightforward, right? But now it gets interesting when you introduce the Stroop effect. And the Stroop effect is simply writing words which spell out a different color than they're colored in. So check, check this out. Uh, now it's hashes. This is blue. Blue is correct. But check this out. So this is uh, the word. It says blue, but it's colored in green. And the right answer is green. You always have to tap the actual color. And you take longer for this. This is the Stroop effect, right? So you get interesting data from this. You, you get the total time it takes you to do it with the hashes. Then you get the total time of the words. And you also get the difference, as you just computed, right? So you get, a, you get a kind of objective measure for your concentration. The second problem, or the second problem to solve was for me that I kind of felt that my sleep was really influencing this, but I had no way to track my sleep. So this was a great excuse to buy an extremely expensive sleep tracker from a Finnish company. So I'm totally not, sp not sponsored by them, but I think it's a great coincidence that it's a Finnish company um, called Amfit. And it's basically this, this thing you put underneath your mattress. This is my mattress. And it's, it's just like this strip thing. It's, and it has like some crazy high-tech magic voodoo in there. And what it basically does is it like tracks your heart rate and breathing rate, so a respiratory rate, super accurately during the night. <laughs> like, like this is like the time resolution is insane, right? I mean, it's like co on, constantly on. Like, and you also get other data from it, like the amount of time you spend in bed and like a heart rate variability and lots of fancy stuff. And you can obviously export it as CSV files again. Great, because we're writing CSV parsers all this time. So you can write another CSV parser. Here's the MFIT directory. Let's have a look. Let's have a look how the data looks. So I did all the plumbing again. So in case you have an MFIT, you can profit. And then basically, I have like, so the same maps come out. It's a daytime thing. The, the daytime is actually the time I left bed. And then like the category is obvious. And you have like duration bed, which is like a closure fraction. But like here, like you have like, you have like the average heart rate, 55. Super interesting value. So can we maybe like just throw this into our model and will it like help us? Um, so it turns out the model still doesn't work. And at this, at this stage, I was kind of like just a bit like close to giving up because I also had the feeling I wasn't understanding the Valpo Wabbit model enough. And like my math and machine learning background is simply not solid enough. But I thought, OK, I should have done something which I should have done in the first place, which is taking a step back and actually visualizing some data. The thing was, I always wanted to do this without third party dependencies, and I was very scared of what was coming next. Coming next was reviving the Encanter. So there's this library in Clojure, which was kind of actively developed like four years ago, maybe, which was called Encanter. And it's like a data science library, and I was really scared that it wouldn't like, work and I would spend enormous amounts of time on this. Turns out it's actually really simple. So um, the API is actually really self explanatory, and it's like, it's, even, it's way easy to get started, like compare that to like a Jupyter IPython notebook where you have like the matplotlib API, which is extremely shitty and mutating everything all the time. With Encanter, it's like basically just two commands. It's like, I want to do a scatter plot and I want to view it, and it's like that. So I was extremely positively surprised. Um, 
and then I basically just started correlating everything with each, with, with other things, and basically just like uh, looking looking for things. So, <laughs> so, and I found out something like fairly interesting actually. So you, you can have a look. So I'm I'm just gonna plot something here. Um, so it gives it returns you this object, and it's actually here, right? So, so this is pretty cool. This is uh, this is like at the at the x-axis is the duration I was awake during the night, in in hours. So one hour is here. And on the y-axis is my Stroop test, uh, test score, which is the duration in seconds, the amount of total time I took to finish this Stroop test. And it kind of looks like actually like kind of a linear relationship. So, I mean, like obviously you have this X XKCD which says like if you test like 100 times, you come out with five tests which are significant. But um, I nonetheless found this interesting. And this also holds for total sleep duration. And my sleep duration, sadly, I only had like a sample like my sleep duration was always like something between six and nine hours. So, and it looked like it was like a linear curve going up. So I thought that was really interesting because it also mirrors my experience of those lazy Sundays where you lie in bed for way too long and sleep for too long and you feel like super foggy the whole day long and can't really focus. Um, so that's interesting. And you could also, also hypothesize that this curve is maybe U-shaped on the other side because like if you sleep like two to three hours, probably your focus is way off again because it's like, it's, it's like not enough sleep. So maybe it's like a U-shaped curve, I don't know. And, may, and maybe this is only specific to me, I also don't know. Um, so wrapping up, next steps. Next steps, I actually would like, need to understand what the hell I'm actually doing. So like, understand like, the statistics behind it, the machine learning behind it, and like, maybe actually read up on some science if it's actually true that like, longer sleep durations actually are associated with uh, being less concentrated. I recently read the super hype book, Why We Sleep, and actually there it doesn't say so, so <laughs> who knows. Um, um, but nonetheless, it's super interesting. In conclusion, machine learning and data science stuff enclosure is kind of hard and painful simply because it's a very library, a very dependency heavy sub subject. You want to like have all the mathy dependencies and you want to have them in closure code and you don't want to interface with them all the time. It just like creates friction. And closure like uh, Dave, one of my coworkers, he famously said, like, Clojure is a great general purpose language, but not for data analysis and machine learning. So that kind of holds true. But on the other side, machine learning and data science and closure is great if you do like the pre-processing part in closure, because the pre-processing part is often not dependency heavy, but language heavy, where you basically profit if you have a great core library where you have like little surprises and like great interactivity. And like the inter interactivity we have in closure is like way better than like an IPython notebook. Um, yeah, so I open sourced this last this morning at 1 a.m. and um, so you can have a look. The, t the code is really well documented. I kind of didn't have time to write the README with some examples, and I didn't upload my data because it's like actually quite personal, and it's like 1,700 entries of my of everything I did like in three months. So I have to find some solution for that. Um, but maybe I can create some sample data. Finally, just a quick shout out to Morantix, who actually paid for me coming here. Um, and I've brought three of my colleagues here, Daniel, Evgeny, and Dave. And we're a deep learning company in Berlin, nearly 30 people right now. We have different projects in autonomous driving, trading, and healthcare. And we work in the healthcare project where you basically create an image viewer in ClojureScript uh, with a backend enclosure, which has like some AI functionalities or deep learning functionalities baked in, which hopefully make radiologists more efficient and safe. So there's a screenshot from it. And um, if you have questions, feel free to ask. I'll be around tonight. You can like, have a beer with me and ask me more about this. There's lots of stories to tell. Um, otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>